how does this work? Because if people are making it work, how, how can I make this work? Hello, and welcome to the episode of the Peter O. Estimates Show. And this is your host, Peter O. Estimates. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today, we have Ascal Cortez, who is a prominent real estate investor, financial specialist, a visionary entrepreneur. His career in the real estate business started at the age of 14 years old when he purchased uh, his first property, completing the deal by the age of 19. By 23, he was the owner of 10 buildings. Today, he owns over 16 buildings in the Zappa Bay region, Florida area. Hello, Pascal, and welcome to the Peter O. Estimate Show. Hello, Peter. Thanks for having me. You know, I uh, I have been looking forward to this conversation because like, um, uh, like you, I'm an immigrant to this country. Uh, I uh, immigrated, uh, migrated to the United States at the age of 10 years old with my mom and dad and my 12 siblings, six brothers and six sisters. And we come from very, very, very humble beginnings. And, you know, I often say that we were so poor, I couldn't afford a dream. Uh, but the reality is that we have a dream life today. Tell us a little bit about, you know, about Pascal, the young boy that migrated from Syria to the United States with his parents. And what was life like for your parents in, uh, in Syria? And what was life like for your parents early on when they first got here to the United States? Yes, yes. Uh, so I definitely know uh, what you mean about too poor to have a dream. But um, God's been very good. But God's been very good. So my father left Syria when I was th when I was born, basically, and migrated to uh, America to establish a place for us. And uh, so I actually we've reunited with him three years later. So it's me, my mother, uh, my sister. And um, it was a long trip, my mom said, to take uh, two young children, uh, three and five years old, internationally, uh, and not knowing English. So uh, in Syria, my mom actually did pretty well. She was a midwife. Um, she drove, a, she would tell me a story about how she would drive a Jeep into the desert and deliver babies, which I think is, is mind blowing because we ha I have four children now and when my wife delivers, there's like 12 people in the room and all the you know, best technology. She was doing that by herself in the desert. No technology, nothing. So it, it's mind blowing to me. It's very inspiring like to, to really, now that I can really value that. And uh, my, my mom did very well for herself. Uh, my father did well. He was a tank mechanic uh, in the military. And then he did a mechanic uh, when he left the military. And um, very hardworking people uh, from, you know, both had 10, 11 brothers and sisters from the farm. My mom was the first person to go to college in a Middle Eastern third world country. Um, it was very impressive. So they decided that they can kind of feel that the frogs being boiled and that it wasn't good for their children long term. So they gave up their comfortable living. They immigrated to America. We grew up in, in, he moved to New Jersey. I grew up in New Jersey and they basically gave up everything. My mom came, uh, raised me and my sister, and then later my younger brother and uh, stayed home. Uh, never really learned English to the level so she could become a midwife in America. Today, she's a nurse uh, after years of putting in hard work to, to become a nurse and loves what she does. It's, it's her passion, uh, but they sacrificed a lot uh, I remember living in like a 500 square foot stick, uh, you know, two family home that four families would live in, attic, first floor, second floor, and uh, basement. And, you know, uh, it, was, it was interesting because like you were saying, you didn't know any better that you can even think of more than what you had. So it was, uh, again, kind of so, so, interesting to look back at that, how I, how I grew up. So, so let me ask you a couple of questions. When you, you use the phrase, the frogs were boiling, what do you mean by that phrase? I, I, I don't understand the terminology. And, so, and what did that mean for you and your family's safety? So the same flop of uh, a frog is boiling, what it means is if you put a frog in a boiling pot, it'll jump right out. 
But if you put a frog in a, a pot of water and slowly turn up the heat, it will get cooked alive. And they felt slowly that things in the Middle East were getting uh, worse and worse. And um, it was becoming more difficult for people to live. So we're Christian Middle Easterners. So uh, that added another mix to it. To, yeah, uh, we're being persecuted for religious beliefs. Correct. Yeah, we're Aramaic. Uh, we speak the language Jesus spoke. Our mass is in Aramaic. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, uh, we've gone through a lot of genocides through the years. So they thought it was time to go somewhere that's more uh, friendly. Uh, right, right. Or safe. Safe for that matter. Safe for that matter. So let me let me ask you a question. When your father migrated, because I'm fascinated with immigrants and, and success stories, um, you know, I, I, I often I often see that many immigrants that come to the States, primarily the, the, the earlier generation, the first generations, hardworking, committed, you know, they, they're almost tunnel blind vision. You know, Gary Vee's is the perfect example of an immigrant family who came to the States, hard work, and, and he as a second generation really turned things around for his family and has become not only a very wealthy man, but a known entity across the world. So tell me, when your father first came to the state, what did he do? What was his job? And what challenges did he face as a immigrant in, in New Jersey? So when he came to America, he actually ended up working at Sears. And okay. he worked as a mechanic at Sears. And, you know, he had all these awards winning, you know, top employee, employee of the month. And he would work basically like, 12 to 16 hours a day, as many hours as he could, seven days a week for three years until he came. And then when he came, he would then work six days a week uh, and work as many hours as possible. And then finally he opened up, he was able to buy a gas station. And then in New Jersey, gas stations, actually you fix cars and you sold a little bit of gas. So really right. your goal is to fix cars. So he worked, you know, morning to night uh, on on his business and on just basically building up the finances so we could uh, move to a, a better area. Cause we live in Patterson, New Jersey, which is a, a, a rough part of New Jersey. So, so what you, so you came here uh, as a young boy, how old were you when you got here? So I moved here when I was uh, three years old. Okay. That, I came to America when I was three uh, and I think it's close to my birthday. So, uh, okay. And, and, and tell me what challenges did you have as a young boy, you know, because obviously from the story you're telling, your father was living in the States. He was here three years before you got here. Uh, he was probably sending some of that money back home and that helped tremendously to live a better lifestyle, right? And then your mom was a man wife that, that, that did well, did financially well, success, was somewhat successful in her career back in Syria. Uh, yeah. But then you, then you come to, to America, to New Jersey, and you're living in a less than 500 square feet stick home, which is like a shotgun, right? It's just one bedroom and another bedroom, that's it, okay? Um, yeah. And, and a couple of families that live with y'all next to each How was that experience for you as a young boy? So the interesting part is, again, when I was young, I didn't know any better. I didn't experience the comfortable life my parents had. Now I'm experiencing the comfortable life. I've built myself up. Uh, to be very comfortable. And, but I didn't experience the fact that my mom had, uh, was able to afford help. And so when I grew up, I grew up very poor in the sense of like, it didn't, like, I remember now my mom would turn on the stove to cook uh, and bake. So this way we could avoid turning on the heat to save money. And again, I thought that was just normal, you know? Uh, and um, now that I'm older and I can get a lot of the, the, the luxuries that they had uh, back then, I can see that they sacrificed a lot. So for me, as I grew older and uh, realized their sacrifice, it made me really value what they did. Uh, at the same time, I learned the hard work ethic and I just thought it was normal. So it was kind of a blessing in disguise having that really low, um, low place to start from because life just became so much easier and better as I, as I grew. And what people found was difficult, I found was very easy because of where I, where I came from. 
So, so elaborate a little bit more when you say when people thought that things were difficult, you thought they were easy. Is that because you had already conditioned yourself mentally and emotionally to go through challenges? And instead of looking at those challenges as a problem, you focus on how do I find a solution for this problem? Was that what it is? Was, was it a mindset or what, what was it? So like things even as basic as um, we didn't get Christmas gifts. You know, so when someone said, oh, I only got one or I only got two, I didn't get any. You know, there is a couple of um, actually t- today they're actually tech CEOs that are part of our community and they would bring me, he would bring me a gift. And um, so for me, it was a big deal, you know, when I got something where for someone that gets multiple gifts, it was a big deal that they didn't keep receiving more. Uh, for me, I had to work. I started working when I was eight uh, at the barbershop to make money so I could buy video games and comic books and, you know, flip, flip cards and games like Gary Vee will talk about. I did the same thing in New Jersey. I think he's from New Jersey too. And, um, for me, that was normal, right? You wanted something, you go get it yourself. I never had the idea or mentality that my parents gave me something because that wasn't going to happen. We had money to do what was necessary for the family, not for, uh, I guess, luxuries. Yeah, so 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 you know, I often say that that you know the entrepreneurs. I've been I've been an entrepreneur since I was a baby, a, a young kid, yes. and it was out of necessity, right? Because you know my parents, what Gary calls a side hustle. I mean, that was a second or third job for my dad. It was something that he did just to make ends meet, right? So we see that today as a side hustle. You know, going to the flea market and buying stuff. My father did that too support his 13 children you, you, you get what i'm saying it was not a side hustle for him it was a it was it, it was a necessity you know and, and and i often say that that entrepreneurial spirit and 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 immigrant families and disadvantaged families is born out of necessity you learn to hustle you learn to be resourceful because you're lacking resources Okay, mm-hmm. so obviously that led you to have a tremendous drive and motivation to get out of the economic conditions that you were in. And at the age of 14, you started looking at real estate. So tell us that story. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, let me adjust my camera real quick. Just to... there we go. So at 14, uh, at that point in time, I was working multiple jobs. Uh, I was uh, flipping Pokemon cards and I was, I was selling Pokemon cards for like $80 a car. I should have kept them because now they're worth about $20,000 a car. Um, comic books, video games, selling candy at school, doing all these different things to make money. And I kind of came to the idea that, you know, it would have been nice to not have to sell the, the things that I liked collecting and two, it would have been nice to be able to, you know, not have to work so much to make money if there was ways to make money faster or better. So then I learned that I heard that you could uh, buy real estate as a person. And for me, that was mind blowing that you could own real estate, that you could own a big apartment complex. I thought it was only for governments and, and big corporations. So that was mind blowing to me that, that, that the ability is out there. And then I found out that the government will give you 80% of the money and you only put down 20% and a third party will pay you to borrow it and you get to keep the spread. So for me, I was like, why doesn't a person do this a hundred times? Why would they only get one? It was uh, such a solution to so many problems. So that was just like, it's just this big aha moment that just made me go on this pursuit to learn everything I could about how does this work? Because if people are making it work, how, how can I make this work? And uh, that's when I started my deep dive. So uh, just, just for clarification purpose, you know, you, you're talking about doing an 80, 20 loan where you put down 20% uh, down payment, but the government doesn't actually give you the other 80% they look, you can get a, a Fannie Mae or, or, or a government backed that loan for, for the difference, just for clarification purposes. I don't want yeah. to. So, when I say government loan, uh, yeah. all, I have a mortgage company today, and yeah. most loans are Fannie Freddie loans, which are quasi right. governmental. So, it's not coming directly from the government, but right. these are 
subsidized loans. For today, like let's say market rate 30 year mortgage is about 3%. The reality is a, a street value alone will be about four and a half percent if you're going to non government subsidized loan. So yeah, you're, you're right. It's not actually from the government, but it's a quasi governmental organization that's subsidized by the back guaranteed by the government. Right. So, so let me, let me ask you a question. That realization that you could do this, uh, obviously you probably in your country, uh, you know, as, as, as a state owned, uh, most of the assets, most of the government, most of the housing, most of the buildings are owned by the government or by large corporations. Is that correct? Is that the case? So you had developed this mindset that, that, you know, maybe you could own a house or if you were lucky, but you were never able to own a building or an apartment complex or a high rise or anything like that. And it would be very, very rare. And normally uh -huh. a government official partner with you. Uh, now, my grandparents did have a large farm and lots of land, but we were third world rich. We were uh, comfortable in the sense <laughs> of having land and having a farm, growing your own food. But then what would happen is you, the people of that country, and I think many people, let's just say, no matter what third world country you're from, you, what happens is if you don't make it into college, because all colleges are usually government owned. So if you didn't score high enough, you don't get to go to college. So if you don't go to college because you scored high enough and you don't have a family that owns land or has a business, you're not really having an opportunity to grow. And what would then happen is you would just live on your family's land and just be a, a hand. Uh, so opportunities were very limited to in that sense. And then loans in most third world countries, you're putting down 50% down on a property uh, if they do have loans available in the sense that, and they're also not low, lower interest rates. Maybe they're very high interest rates as well. So the barrier to entry into college, barrier to entry into home ownership, land ownership, or investing is very hard, you know, uh, compared to America's the land of opportunity, you know, it's a little easier. You know, so it's literally America is literally the land of opportunity. You can also because you get a yeah. chance, right? The, what people misunderstand is this is the land of opportunity. It's not the land of handouts. This right. is the the pursuit of happiness. This doesn't even guarantee your happiness. You get to right. pursue your happiness. You get the chance right. to go for it. Um. So that's that's the interest. That's the the nice part of it. Where as a minority, as a, a person coming from a land that doesn't have as many opportunities. You get to see the, the 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 benefits and values. You know, you get to really understand the American dream. Yeah, I, I think we're able to appreciate it, right? We're able to 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 appreciate the fact that there's opportunities that were not available in our country. Therefore, you wonder why isn't anybody else looking at this? You know, it's almost for us, it's a gold rush, right? And for oh, others, yeah. you know, and for others, we take it for granted. And 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 you know, I had very similar experiences. Uh, like you, you know, I, I, I saw very early on that, yeah, my father worked 12, 14 hours a day, uh, but I also quickly realized that working 12, 14 hours a day, doing a menial job, okay, uh, was not going to get my father out of poverty ever, 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 ever. He was never going to be able to save money. He was never able to be able to, to, to do a lot of the things that perhaps he wished he would have been able to do because... He lived in what I call a continuous, persistent uh, pursuit of survival states, you know, uh, from hand to mouth and mouth to hand. And that was it. There was never left over for, any, for, for anything else. So with that in mind, how did you learn? How did you learn? Because one of the things that I want to, uh, in, in, in this episode, I want people to usually take your knowledge, your experience. How can they apply it? If somebody today... Is, 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 is a young man or a young woman that is interested in breaking that dysfunctional cycle, that, 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 that social conditioning, and maybe look for other opportunities. Maybe they're, they're, they're stuck in a rut and they don't know how to get out. How did you begin to, to identify problems? What is the process? What, what should people do out there that are looking to improve their life? So one, I'd probably say, um, excuse me, Sorry about that. So uh, I would say one, gratitude. So when Gary Vee says gratitude, it's hard, it's hard to kind of hear him when he says that. But first, you have to be able to have gratitude and appreciate what you do have because you do have something. And when you have that gratitude, it is a good place to be able to move forward from. 
Uh, when you're going, if someone came to you, Peter, and this, they were like, Peter, you got to give me this opportunity. And they were ungrateful. They, they just were demanding in a way. And as if they needed a handout, that, that mindset doesn't really give you the opportunity for growth and opportunity to get blessed, right? When you're coming from a place that I'm thankful for what I have and I'm pursuing for, for better, it is easier to, to grow. So first gratitude. And then the next thing I would say is love what you're doing. Enjoy what you're doing. Uh, gamify it if, if you have to. Because everything I was doing, I was having fun doing it. I really enjoyed the, the, the chance to even make money. The fact that I could work and make money, I thought that was amazing. And if I could work and save up my money, and I thought I was growing my savings bigger and bigger, I thought that was amazing. The opportunity to uh, buy something or invest in something, flip it, I just thought it was a lot of fun. And I dug deep into it. So in the same idea where like a musician will play music, listen to music and, and analyze, you know, styles, 100 hours a week, no one questions that. And it's what their passion is. The same aspect, you got to apply it to whatever your passion is, whatever you're trying to develop yourself in. Because when you have that passion, you have that knowledge, the skill, and when you have that appreciation, all of that grows. And the last part is you need to have faith, right? You have to have faith that things will work out, will get better. And sometimes when faith is hard to get, I kind of would fall back on, well, if I lose, it's not going to get much worse than this. I'm already at the bottom. So you're not going to go much lower than this. So that was something that was, I tried to break down my own psychology, uh, the, the, old, the, old, the saying to thine self be true. Then you can kind of understand what you're thinking, why you're thinking it, and you can pursue more. And 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 and, and I get that, and I understand that, and I truly appreciate that because I I uh, I saw that even in um, in uh, in very difficult times. I remember as a young boy watching my mother in her rocking chair, and she would particularly late in the evening after you know things got quiet down and, and, and kids were going to bed and. You know the house was silent. Mom would rock her in her rocking chair, and she had a rosary. She was very devout Catholic, and she would pray for our own end. And as a young boy, not understanding, um, you know, not understanding, or having appreciation of gratitude, I would often think to myself, "What the hell does she pray for so much?" And our circumstances never changes. And the reality is that every single one of my prayer, my my mother's prayers, have been answered. Because I lived a life that I'm sure she prayed that I was that I would live someday, you know. And I think a lot of times, what happens to us as human beings, we are looking, we are such a immediate gratification generation that we want to see immediate results in everything that we do. But the reality is, okay, that the work is for today; the results are for the future. Just yes. like prayer, the prayers is for today; the results are for the future. It is for us to gain strength. And, and appreciation for what we're doing and enjoying the journey. And when we enjoy the journey, it's a lot easier for us to be able to overcome the challenges that come along the way of the journey. So uh, what, what what was your process as a young 19-year-old to identify a property and actually end up buying a property? What, what, what did you do? Uh, how did you decide that that was a property? And, and what did you get the money to, uh, to put the down payment? So when I, I started working when I was eight, uh, I was literally saving my money from that age. I would invest it into uh, video. I would buy video games and then I would sell them. I would trade them. I would buy comic books and baseball cards and trade up. And I would buy Pokemon cards and, you know, do that. I was at 16, I was uh, buying stocks and I would like uh, trade Walmart stock or buy, and resell and um, a lot of, a lot of little things. And I saved up roughly about 30, to $35,000, I think about $35,000. At 18, I started, 18, 19, I started working with the bank. And uh, as a teller, within 15 months, I had my own desk. I was one of the youngest people doing mortgages, opening checking accounts, credit cards, back when you can actually sell mortgages at the desk in the bank. Um, and I just saved up all my money and just kept on investing it in different ways. Uh, then um, I was, again, 
I did my research and did what I could and then learned, I guess I learned and from 14 to 19, I was studying construction. So I was actually doing construction with people. I learned how to do a lot of different uh, jobs. And when I was uh, 17, I was actually building custom cabinets with this, uh, my father's friend. And my father wouldn't let me um, in the summer go hang out and play. He would make me come to work with him for like 90 hours a week, morning to night. I was working with him, except for Sunday. I would go to church and I would um, cut the grass. That's the only time I got off in the summers. And then other times than when I wasn't working with him in the summer, he would make, he would allow me to leave, but I had to go work for his friend for free. So one guy did tile, one guy did different projects, one guy did cabinets. And I learned a bunch of this on the construction side. Then as I was growing up, I was learning the banking side. Uh, I have a, a, a CPA mentor. I learned the tax game. So I learned every aspect to the financial game and to the construction game. And I merged everything together to uh, in the real estate business and then the management side. So when I started, I did everything myself. And what I thought was a good deal, I bought. And like most people say, the first deal actually, when you look back, was not that great of a deal. But with real estate, you buy and wait, and eventually it becomes a good deal. So I did sell it later for a good profit. But um, then the second deal, I learned from it, from the first one. I got to outdo, outperform my previous. The third deal was a blessing. I literally, if you looked on paper how I could qualify for it, I couldn't. Like it wouldn't, it was a commercial property. And uh, I prayed for it and literally God showed me how to do it. And I ended up buying that property and it's my most profitable property. And I still own it today. So um, it's, it's, you know, you just, you know, originally when you start, you start looking at, you know, basically value, your dollar per square foot, cap rates, things like that. And that's how you, I think, start thinking in the beginning, because when you come from a third world country, a lot of times we have a more of like a, a gold standard or an oil standard. We have a different way of thinking. We don't really think debt. Um, where we, when you come here and you finally learn how the system really works and our dollar is really a debt-based system, you don't. You have to understand, well, really how money is made is not on cap rates and dollar per square foot and whatnot. It's really on wealth creation, wealth growth. And when you change, then I had to learn that as I grew, I had to change my thinking. But in the beginning, I was looking at the basic metrics, dollar per square foot, cap rates. And, 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 and um, I, I want to dive into something for, for a second here. There's a couple of things that words that Stan have you been saying that really kind of defines your highest values, right? And you talked about faith, you talked about gratitude, you talked about worth and ethic, you talked about mentorship, you know, mentorship through, through, you know, going in, in and working for your father's friend, the Bill Cadman, going with your father and, 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 and doing labor work while he was at work, with, you know, 14, 16 hours a day. So it, it, it's almost like there's a court set of values that you were developing along the way. Now, when you went on your own, when you were on your own and you started buying your, your, your first piece of property, your first real estate piece of property, um, uh, Normally, our biggest credits, our biggest naysayers are the people around us, our friends, our family, our circle of influence, okay? Um, what kind of feedback were you getting with your parents? Because this is a big dive for you. This is something, you know, your father for all practical matters, he had a, a, a mechanic shop and a gas station, and your mom had, you know, been, been a neat wife, but, but they were not very, they were not risk takers, right? So... For you to come in at 19 years old, and, and, and this is very important, how were you able to shut down the naysayers, or how were you able to turn them into becoming the adversaries? So at, so I actually was working with my father. He, at that point in time, he, he uh, so in New Jersey, actually, an engine fell on him, and he basically broke his back, and he had to, um, you know, took a lot of rehab to get, to get him back to health. So then we moved to Florida. When we moved to Florida, he opened a convenience store. He bought a building, opened a convenience store, and I worked with him there. And I was continuing to work with him, and I was fine with continuing to work with him. But he had limiting beliefs. He was not looking to really grow, and he was very conservative. And that, for me, was not a fast enough growth. 
So that's when I started doing things on my own because of his, his limiting beliefs. Again, he did the best he could in the way that things were back home or back in the day. He did the best he could. She did the best she could. But when I learned how the system works here, when I learned that there's opportunities for those who take it, I started thinking, I need to go out and do this. And he was uh, very um, against it, basically saying I was going to fail and I shouldn't do it. And um, it's funny. So I bought my first duplex. And then about a year later, I bought another duplex. And I bought uh, a seven unit like six months later uh, with a you know, really short amount of time. And I was sitting at the table with him and it was him and his friend who were sitting outside uh, at my childhood home. And I was saying, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have uh, 23 units by the age of 23, right? I wanted a really good, cool sounding goal. And he's like, you're never gonna have 23 units by the age of 23. And at that time I said, I have 17 units right now. He didn't know I bought more than that duplex. He didn't know that I kept on growing and pursuing. And he was kind of shocked that I was at to that level. Um, it's, and it's what I learned to disassociate your feeling of value and self-worth from what other people said and to not take it personally. Because again, they did the best they could with what they knew. So you can't expect someone to validate your logic and your uh, research if they don't know anything about what you're doing. So I had to get strong enough inside to know that you don't need their permission. You don't need their validation. You have to do what you think is right. And when you win, they'll support you. That's and, 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 and I love it. You know, I, re I remember, you know, early on, uh, uh, in, in my business career and I was moving on, my, my father would just, he would never ask me questions, but every so often I would, you know, I would walk into his house or, 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 or a, an uncle or a man would be visiting and my dad would be bragging about me and all of my accomplishments. Okay. Yet he would never tell me that he yes. was proud of my accomplishments. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the reality is it, it goes right back to something that, that 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 you said a minute ago, he had um, he had limited beliefs. Okay, uh, he, he he you know he was able to provide give you what he had. Right, he can't give you more than what he had. Now, <clears throat> the lesson here, the lesson that we want our audience to learn is how are you not applying those beliefs? Uh, how do you break that cycle? How do you move forward to make sure that what you learn from your father, you don't pass on to your children. Okay. What are you doing different? How have you learned this? So there's always that thing, and I'm trying to fight it today because I'm at a I'm a very comfortable level now, but I'm trying to take it to another level. And I'm trying not to hold myself back. And what I do is I try to put myself around the right people that think a certain way so I can learn and grow with them and from them. So iron sharpens iron as a man sharpens another man. So that, that thought process that it really keeps on making myself invest in myself. Right. Uh, I, I spent a significant amount of money to be, to go to this, uh, you know, 10 day event in Belize with Robert Kiyosaki, uh, Ken McElroy, um, Dr. Doug Duncan, chief economist for Fannie Mae was there, like really around the people, uh, George Gannon was there, around the people that are thinking different. And also if they think a certain way that they have real world experience, not that they hear someone say it, but actually what they see um, firsthand from what they're doing. So that way um, you can make logical decisions. So one of the things I learned when my father was very critical about what I was doing is for a while when you're younger, you try to dis dismiss what they say, that they're wrong, they don't know what they're talking about. 
Then as I got more mature, um, I think it was around like 21, I started saying, let me hear what they have to say and like hear it, put, put value to it. That's why I don't believe the whole like how bipolar our country has become. It's a problem when you're not hearing both sides because you need to hear all perspectives. So you can have a very uh, logical assessment. So I said, okay, let me hear him. And what I'm going to do is everything he said, I'm going to do what I can to reduce the probability of that negative thing happening. And then for all the people that were like, there's some people I met that were very rah, 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 rah. And they were so extremely optimistic. And I would say, okay, instead of me dis dismissing them, let me hear everything they say and increase the probability of the positive thing happening. So what I would do is I would increase the posit positive probability, reduce the negative probability. And as an investor, you make the gap. And that's how you can make your gap and make, your, and make that profit consistent. So that is kind of one of the things that was my, another aha moment where it takes maturity to reach that point. And, 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 and you know, the, the, the reality is that it doesn't matter how much we learn, how much we grow, inherently we're going to uh, adopt some of our parents' beliefs, right? And you said something, you know, right now you're at a, place where you're comfortable, right? You reach a certain level of success. Your 33 or 34 or 35 buildings may equate to what your father was one grocery store, one gas station. You know, he was perfectly content and happy being able to meet his immediate needs, okay? Today, your needs uh, may be higher or more serious, but you're meeting those needs. So uh, it, 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 that has a tendency of getting us to a comfortable state, you know? And, and, and what happens is that the only way that we are able to achieve or climb to the next level, to the next phase of our lives, is that we need to become a different person than we were at the earlier phase. Because the reality is that every phase of our lives requires a different us, okay? And if you don't have a circle of influence that can help you get, to, to get you to the next level, you're going to have to find one or you're not going to get to the next level. If you at, Continue to adopt the same belief system that got you to your first million or second million or third million or 30 million, it's not going to get you to 60 or 90 or 100 million dollars. Okay. Because it takes a different, uh, complete different type of skill sets. There's actually a system, okay, for everything that we do in life, whether it's right or wrong. There is a system. Okay. And the idea, and I love what you I love what you said that, that you're invested in yourself. Uh, by going to this mastermind for 10 days in Belize and being around people that are, that are smarter, wiser, more knowledgeable than you are. And the reality is uh, a lot of our parents didn't have the resources, the time, because they were in such a survival state to even begin to think, okay, to even begin to think with clarity the way that you think today or that I think today. So, let me ask you a question. Moving forward, moving forward, what is it that you do on a daily basis that gives you the clarity to be able to think with, uh, uh, with possibilities, with greater ambition, and to see a foreseeable future that would get you to the next level? What is it that you do on a daily basis? How do you not become stagnant? So um, I have a life, uh, have a saying that kind of involves everything I do in life. It's invest in the front end, save in the back end, make a lot of money. So where you put in the work to, to, to do something right, to educate yourself properly, to grow yourself, grow your base, so then anything else you're doing will last long term. So one other than uh, one big thing is I invest in my body. I, I take care of my body. I take lots of vitamins. I exercise uh, daily. And I do that. In addition to that, obviously I'm investing in my mind. So I keep myself educated. I listen to almost everything out there. And I am part of multiple different groups to be educated on what's going on. I have many mentors in different spaces. I have a tech mentor, I have a financial mentor, I have a real estate syndication mentors. Uh, I have a lot of mentors that are guiding me and showing me so I can learn from them and uh, speed up the learning curve. 
Because one of the things I found that is the most valuable is time. So I'm trying to save as much time as possible and, and have that curve, the learning curve, be as fast as possible. Because it, it, what you said, you said something earlier that you know really hit it on the head. And, and I had a conversation with my father a few years ago, and I think he like truly saw me differently after this conversation. And I basically I told him I was like, look, you know, you keep on talking about what what I'm doing, and as if I should keep doing this. But you, you, one thing we have to like remember is that who we were brought us to where we are, but who we are is not going to take us to where we need to go. So we have to change who we are so we can become the person who we want to be. Every seven years, every piece of your body is literally different. Absolutely. Every, every seven years, you yeah. are not the same person. Now, if you take bad uh, care of your body, you're not taking care of your mind, you're not taking care of yourself, you're going to be worse than you are in seven years. But you can see someone that actually didn't take care of themselves when they were younger, and they started focusing on doing the right thing for themselves in their life and their body. In seven years, they actually look younger than they did. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Who we are, we, we create who we are. You, you know, you, you really said it uh, well earlier, but we, we're making our future. We are building, we're constructing it. So when you invest in it, you're, you're gonna get a huge benefit. And what I've also noticed is that I've seen people that have been extremely wealthy, and lose everything. And I've seen a lot of those people. And it's usually when it comes to short-term uh, benefits that end up sacrificing the long-term. And they don't realize that at the moment. It's hard to in the moment. but um, And that's why I try to have varying perspectives around me to kind of, you know, be a, a mirror so I don't fall into the traps of thinking that I am so good and so smart and I can, you know, do things that, you know, isn't wise. Yeah, I, I, uh, I want to talk about, about something you, you brought up a minute ago that I think is extremely important. That is speed up the learning curve. OK, and, 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 and the easiest way. And, and today we have a plethora of tools available to us to be able to speed up the learning curve. You know, uh, our parents and our great grandparents and previous generations learning system was either through school, okay, uh, through, through, or, or through college, uh, through formal education, okay? But the reality is that today there is a plethora of opportunities for one to, to speed up the learning curve. If you're able to set in a mastermind with somebody that has been able to take a company from, 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 a, from a startup to, to a publicly held multi-million or billion dollar company, you want to be able to spend time with an individual like that to be able to speed up the learning curve because there's invaluable information that somebody that has done that first in experience is going to be able to teach you in a matter of two, three minutes of conversation that you would ever learn in a classroom. That's not negating the importance of education or formal education because I still believe in traditional education, okay? I, I believe that it teaches certain disciplines that, that, that the young people need to have in order to, to create other skills, okay? Uh, but, but imagine if you were able to spend a day with Grant Cardone, how much do you think that would benefit you if you're able to spend a whole day with him? And it doesn't matter what level it is. I think that some of the, uh, some of the, uh, of the safeguards that we need to remove from Okay, which are very also very prevalent in our in, our, in, 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 in minority in, in minority communities is well, don't tell anybody what you're doing, or you know, stay away from so and so. You know, uh, keep your head low. You know, uh, don't rock the boat. Okay, uh, I think that there are certain belief systems. You know, discipline I learned from my parents, working hard, uh, a work ethic I learned from my parents, uh, faith and trust. Okay. Uh, but I also had to go out there and adapt dreamer and risk taker and, and knowledge breaker and, and, and experience and take chances and gamble, okay? Because how else can we experience what's available or what's going to work if we don't gamble on it, if we don't take a chance, if we don't take a risk? The, the reality is that success is an accumulation of many failures and a small pile of successes, 
Okay, mm -hmm. and, and, and we only do that through experience. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, you know, speed up the learning curve. Tell me some of the ways that today you, okay, uh, Pascal speeds up the learning curve. Besides that, that mastermind you went to in the least, which other ways do you do it? How is it that you do it? What tools are out there available for the audience for somebody starting? So one of the things I do to make sure that I'm get one, that we have the issue, someone made a very funny video about how they can do research today and find how coffee can cause uh, blindness and also find equivalent research to show that coffee will make our site better. So we are, we are over, overrun with information that will um, paralyze us. And that's a big thing I think is happening today. There's a large group of people that will come and because again i go so i'm on i'm on uh, youtube and ig and i have a pretty fo large following on ig and people will come and ask me questions and i'm seeing these people now for like two years and i can i can i remember scenarios i'm very good at remembering scenarios um and at a certain point i'm just like okay you know you're you're now you really showed me who you are you are overrun with so much data that you're frozen, you cannot make a decision. So step one, if I'm going to go collect information from, from a source, I'm going to collect it from people that are successful doers. I, there's a, so much content out there today that is people talking about something and explaining it, and they actually do very well at selling their course and their ideas, whatever. But those people, the ones that are most successful, I found have not actually done it. They're not a doer. They're going to rah, rah, rah you. Um, there is some exceptions, right? Like Grant Cardone is an actual uh, real estate investor and is successful. Um, there's Robert Kiyosaki. There's real estate guys. There is people out there. But when I go to the people who are successful and technical knowledge, because a lot of times when you finally do have the, the, the power and the, the energy inside of yourself to do something, you kind of need some technical help and answers. So I want someone to be able to encourage me and to, to give me technical help, but also a good mentor could also discourage you to say, hey, you're, you're not doing the right thing. You should stop doing that because it's not all about, because, because we have this thing where we have a group of people that are motivational speakers that it's just, it's only good. Well, let's be real. It's not always good. You know, there, it depends, you know, it depends on the situation. And um, so something about you, we mentioned something else earlier, like we were talking about growth and positions and time and certain things you have to do. Like, so my YouTube, my IG grew a lot. My YouTube did not. And I had someone that had a successful channel review it that actually grew his channel, not a company that advertises to help you grow with social media. And he reviewed it. He's like, you know, the reason you're not growing on YouTube is the content you're producing is the type of content that, or the, the content that you're naturally producing is the type of content that you would produce when you already have a hundred thousand dollars, hundred thousand followers. So the, you're, it's good, but it's good when you're at this level to get to the hundred thousand level, you actually have to do this type of content in the beginning, and then you grow to that level, and then the, the type of content you're naturally producing will work. So at certain levels, you have to have certain skills and to be able to produce something technically to accomplish your goal. So that's why I feel like when people are getting information, always get it from a source that is that has been a successful business person, that is is not just successful, but technically successful as well. That is going to be the, the best uh, roadmap for, for success. I, I absolutely. And I want to break down a couple of things that you brought up. And you, you, brought up, you brought up listening to multiple people. Okay? And I truly believe that as individuals, we need to create all the information that we get into. It so we don't get into paralysis of analysis, right? So we have to curate our, our lifestyle. We have to curate who we follow, what music we listen to, what videos we watch, what televisions we, we watch. I am very, very conscious about everything that I do, okay? I truly believe that we become um, 
uh, the the total uh, the total sum of the five people that we spend the most time with. Okay, and call that people, call that content, call that information, call that knowledge, whatever it is. But the more that you consume, whatever it is that you're consuming, is what you're going to end up becoming. You're going to adopt a belief system, a knowledgeable system, a system that is going to be representative of the things that you are consuming. So I'm very careful with the people I follow. I want to follow people that are that are positive, that are learners, that are growers, that are making an impact in the community because those are the things that are important to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. I also want to make sure that I don't consume music that is nasty, that has negative connotations, that it, that, that 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 has negative social impact. I also want to make sure that I don't follow people in social media that are troublemakers, that that that, that, that are that are writers, that are that they create conflict, that are that are uh, tools. I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't follow people like that. Okay. And, and I want to make sure I live a clean life. So I want everything in my life to be representative of that. Okay. Uh, uh, the people I follow, the music I listen to, the places I attend, the things that I do, the books that I read. Okay. So I think that is very, that's, that's very important information, particularly for the younger generation that, that once the things that that that, that, that by listening to rap music or or, or 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 creating this phantom image of who they are, okay, no, become who you want to be, and then follow people that are that are the kind of people that you want to be like, the success that you want to accomplish, the business model that you want to accomplish, the the the, the car that you want to drive, the clothes that you want to wear, all of that. You can, you know, those can become your cyber mentors, you know? And I go back to the plethora of information that's available to us. You said it, there's there's so much information. As a matter of fact, on a daily basis, we get over 50,000 sound bites of information. In a week, we get more information than our parents and grandparents ever got in their entire lifetime, okay? If something happened in New York 30 years ago, it may be, three weeks or a month before you find out on the other side of the country. Today, you find out in, in less than a second, in less than a soundbite, a soundbite of information away. So we need to make sure that we are able to quiet the noise out there and we are physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and financially fit on a daily basis to be able to operate with clarity, to be able to operate from a single state of consciousness, to be able not to time travel, Okay, and I allow the most to disturb you, and I truly believe that. And when you do that, okay, you're able to see the world for what it is, not for what you wanted to be, not more for what somebody else says it is, but for you, for what it is, and then you're able to make wise decisions. You know, I what I you said so many things that I love. One, I when I when I talk, people, I said when you're growing yourself, I have I think there's there's five pillars to what makes you whole. Spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, financially. You can be successful in, 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 in some, but if you're not successful in the other parts, you're going to feel like there's something missing in your life. And you, you said so many good things and uh, that, 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 that hit it on the head. Another thing that you said that was really good was about the music you listen to, where I listen to house music, uh, one of the genres I listen to. And you can have a upbeat song, but the song itself, what they're saying is depressing. Sure. You're like a happy depression. And it's like, no, that, that's, that's not really healthy. And I have to be conscious to be like, okay, I'm going to avoid this one, even though I really like the, the way it was produced. And the same thing with rap music. Some of the rap music, it might have the feeling that it's negative, but it's actually what they're saying is positive. So you have to like, it's, it's our, our content right now is so blended that you have to be consciously aware of what's happening. And even down to like, I was, I was trying to explain this to other uh, Christians because uh, I have a lot of um, Christian organizations that I'm part of. I said, you have to be conscious as a Christian that we don't fall into the trap that being poor is good. Being poor is not good. That is not the goal that God had for you. God wants you to be successful. Now, could there be an opportunity where you're going through a trial and that you are poor and you're going through a struggle? Yes. But do not feel that my suffering by choice 
is a gift to God. Now, I, I say, yes, work hard. And if you want to give away everything that you worked for, okay, fine. Do it. That's a choice that's on your heart, that's on your mind. Go ahead. But don't think that you're going to choose to be poor, choose to make bad decisions, and say that I am now a better person because of it. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, unfortunately, primarily, primarily in the Catholic religion, okay, from my personal experience, coming from Latin America, from Mexico, from a country that is a devout Catholic country, uh, we saw the power of manipulation that the government and the church impose on people. And you're exactly right. And what most people don't realize that, you know, uh, it's okay to be poor and sacrifice and, and, and all of that. It was a way of manipulating people into submission, into controlling them, and to be able to manipulate them. And I don't want this to become a religious conversation because I do believe the, I do respect the belief system, regardless of what it may be of everyone. That's your own belief system. But if you want to advance in the world, it's, it, just like we take an inventory on our businesses every day, just like we take our car for a checkup, okay, every day, just like we service our air conditioning and our appliances and our washer and our dryers and our, and, 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 and our dishwasher, maybe it is time for you to do an analysis and an inventory in your belief system, okay? More particularly, if you're not reaching the level of success of accomplishments that you want to, okay? Maybe it is something in your belief system, in the, in your belief system that, that is outdated, okay? We have the most powerful, the world's greater computer that we carry between our ears each and every day, okay? And yet very few people invest the time or the resources to update them. Download it and upload and upgrade it on a daily basis. Okay, and I'm going to go back to the power of information and the power of resources that are available to you today. Okay, and you and I have been recipients of the benefits of the power of information and technology. YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, ebooks, mentors, cyber mentors, masterminds, e courses, online courses. There's a plethora of podcasts, okay, blogs. There's a plethora of information that if you want to, that if you want to change your life, it's available for you to learn, okay. It's available for you to change your life. It's available for you to make a difference in your household, in your personal life, and in your community. And as a citizen of the universe, we have a responsibility to do that, okay. We have an obligation, okay. You cannot continue to live in a state of ignorance, okay. Um, if you have children, it's your obligation to surpass and move forward and provide a better life and better quality of opportunities for them. If you didn't have them, that's not an excuse for them not to have them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but, something I want to add to what you said before, when we're talking about, let's, let's also, like when you mentioned, let's not make this a, a religious conversation. I agree with you on that because even politically and socially, People will start saying things, um, the rich or bad, right? Things like that. Yeah. And, um, and, 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 you know, things like that. But at the same time, they will do the, the opposite of what they say. And they will be enabling the problem. So we really have to take a, again, to, the, to thine self be true. Have a true measure of what we are saying. And are we actually acting because what we say does mean a lot, but what we do also means even more. That is really how you measure in a, in a person, is how do they act under pressure? How do they treat other people? Do they say what they're going to do? That is one of the biggest things that I found when you're looking to add quality people in your life and around you, is that can, are they genuine people? Are they people of their word? Because one thing I found, the higher you climb up, the value of having people around you that are true to their word and that are going to do what they say becomes more and more priceless. Absolutely. And that, that skill where you can have a, a trusted individual becomes extremely valuable. The, 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 their, their, their worth is a lot. So 
And, and that's what you realize is that there is certain things that um, are very important as, as a person. I, I, absolutely. Basco, we, we're coming up, being respectful of your time, um, coming up to the end of the hour. Uh, tell me what is the biggest lesson that you learned from your father? I learned what he did do is he was very hardworking. He was very hardworking. He was persistent. He took a challenge and he definitely uh, tried to make the best of it and could figure out a way to fix something. He was very, very good. A man that, again, he had a third grade, a fourth grade education. He can learn how to fix basically anything. Um, in that, the ability of what we can do and we're capable of is, 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 not don't short yourself that was the other part is that because of how smart he was without the formal education that it was how he shorted himself that kept him from everything he wanted to have wow so so expand on that a little bit more expand on that a little bit more because i think a lot of us do that right we possess incredible talents, incredible abilities, yet we shorten ourselves. So expand on that, how you saw that happening in your dad. How I did it myself, because a lot of times when you have to really reflect on how, how I did it myself, if I looked back and they said, what would you do differently? I said, I would have gone bigger. At 19, uh, 18, 19, I bought the first duplex and I did 20% down because I was conservative. I would have gone a fourplex and put down three and a half percent because I learned that appreciation is how you create wealth. Value added how you create wealth. I wouldn't have put down that much. Then I looked back recently and they said, then I was what? I was actually 23 years old when the 08 market crashed, 23, 25. And when that happened, I didn't push hard enough to go get investors. I bought some properties for myself. I made really good money on them, but I should have gotten investors and pushed out and put my voice out there. I would have gone harder. I would have not been as conservative and not conservative in a, uh, you know, instead of risky, but instead of pushed more and, and, and drove, driven harder. Um, and then again, recently, same thing. I looked back and I said, you're having limiting beliefs and it's holding you back from what you're capable of because you're putting this false ceiling on yourself and it's holding you back from what you're capable of. Like I'm actually in the process of opening uh, and creating an app with one of my mentors. He actually did, he has, is a tech company and he would deliver gifts to me when I was a kid. And he's been in the business for 35 years, ha never passed uh, the fourth grade, taught himself how to code in the 80s, wrote code. And today, Wells Fargo, Bank of America uses his code. Apple Pay is on his platform. Every Apple Pay transaction goes through his system. Wow. And uh, I told him about the app. Because I, again, I own an accounting firm, I own an insurance agency, I own a mortgage company. I've studied all... The, the financial system and all aspects and how they function. Um, and I told him, hey, this is my idea. This is my the app that I think you should have and it would, would help everybody. And he said, well, uh, that idea I've actually heard many large companies are, are trying to do. It. And I'm going to tell you that yours is the best that I've seen. And in the time I've been building it out in the sense of how it would function, how it would work on paper, and because um, again, it's my passion my, of how the system, financial system can help strengthen people, better people. And recently I'm like, okay, you got to do this. And he even came to me and said, hey, I will partner with you on this. And again, it's someone that's like literally gave, been nice to me and gave me for years and never asked for anything. So I'm like, all right, this guy has faith. He's being honest then I have to, there's something here. And for me, I was just like, but you're not a tech guy. You're not a tech guy. How are you going to do this? And then and recently, like about a couple of days ago, I was like, because I'm fighting this, right? I'm fighting this, 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 this glass ceiling I put on myself. I said, who said you're not a tech guy? 
Because you're always the one talking about efficiencies and processes and whatever and using systems and apps and whatever. You are this person. You're just saying that you're, you can't build a, a billion-dollar company. You can't build a trillion-dollar company. Like, why? Why can't you do this? Like, you literally have an idea that someone that's in the business says you have an amazing idea and I want to work with you. So that thing is one of the hardest things because it's this leash. It's these chains, these shackles that you don't know that are there on yourself. And, um, it, you know, to, to, to break free is, again, requires to thine self be true. You have to be conscious of what's going on to, 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 to really let go. I, I, absolutely. And I love that. I love the example that you cited. And, and, and in unfairness to you, you know, uh, what you did early on at the team buying your first property was a function of the information that you had available and access to. Okay. You have evolved as an individual, you have evolved as a man, you have changed and grown through experiences and through being able to take challenges and, and either succeed or fail through them. And you've done something that your parents didn't do and, and, and you're at a different level than you had ever been able to accomplish. But I think it's also that today, we also must realize the fact that we don't need to know everything, okay? Because today's society Today's world is, um, is more about the who than the how. Find the who that knows the how that you need. Create alliances and collaborations with the who that can help you get the how that you need in order to grow and expand, okay? And lastly, lastly, and, 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 and more importantly, to that self be true, okay? Question your belief system. Question the, uh, the, the, the social conditioning that you have adopted, because that is the only way that you are going to be able to break through the false glass ceiling that you have created for yourself, okay? If you're stuck somewhere, nobody's stopping you. The same mental glass ceiling that you have placed in yourself is a self-imposed limit to believe in the excel. You gotta question where that came from, you know? And I do that every single day. I do that through journaling. If I'm, if I'm finding a challenge in my life, if I'm stuck somewhere, I ask myself as I journal on the daily basis, why am I thinking this way? Why am I believing this way? Why can't I get to the next level? And believe it or not, if you continue to tend to those five pillars, the physical, the mental, the spiritual, the financial, and, 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 and the emotional on a daily basis, you're going to be able to see lack with clarity. You know, in closing, Pascal Corcus, I want to thank you for this opportunity. I know that this is a different kind of interview, and this is kind of different kind of podcast. But I wanted to have this format, one, because I want people to know who you are and where you came from and where your mindset is. Everybody can read about your accomplishments and, and the properties that you own and who you are through your YouTube. But who is at the hardcore and what is the, what his belief system is, what is his value system is, and how is he making changes to impact his community, his family, and generations to come? And that's what's important to me, and that's what's important to our audience. Pascal Corcus, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being our guest. And I look forward to getting to know you better. Thank you so much. God bless. Have a good day.